Hello, everyone, and welcome to an adventure. Your guide is going to be Paul Taylor, a professor and also a director and a curator. The title of the adventure is Behind the Scenes Seeks Legacy of the Punjab. And Paul Taylor is a director or the director of the Asian Cultural History Program, as well as a curator of Asian, European, and Middle Eastern ethnology, all of this at the world famous Smithsonian Institution. I wanted to begin with a couple of questions that have arisen in my mind. The primary one is having lived most of my life with an obscure ethnic history of Sikhs, I would like to know how you and others have managed to bring this subject into the mainstream in such a spectacular fashion. Well, thanks for the complimentary question, I have to say, but it certainly wasn't me. It was lots and lots of people, uh, and primarily people in the Sikh uh, community. Uh, I would say that the model of what became the Sikh Heritage Project is really a series of heritage projects which preceded it within the program that I direct at the Smithsonian, which is called the Asian Cultural History Program. And uh, so uh, there, was, there was a kind of precedent for how to set up such a program or a project. I mean, as an anthropologist, I don't see this as an obscure topic. And I also, uh, uh, frankly, if, you're, if, you're, if your scope within the Smithsonian is as curator for Asia, Europe, and the Middle East, you're not looking for just um, satellite views of the whole area as what you're trying to do. You're actually looking for the really interesting and uh, specific stories that are uh, uh, of great interest, but also of conceptual importance for the history of humankind. And, uh, certainly uh, many aspects of the cultural heritage of Sikhism uh, fit that. And it has an outsized uh, um, importance uh, in the history of uh, South Asian literature and uh, art and so on, even though it was not recognized for a long time. But the other important point here is that the Smithsonian itself had not gotten around to that before. There are plenty of studies and books and exhibitions about Hinduism and Islam and so on. So this was a, an area waiting to be developed that hadn't been uh, developed before, but certainly very fitting. Not all six agree on all things at all times. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, I'm, I don't know that you would find a hundred percent. For some people, history is extremely important, others less so. But about um, a person's identity, that's very important to everyone. And a an exhibition or a project like this with its other sort of uh, points of contact with the public, the launch of a new book, uh, a conference, a, uh, um, an outreach event like a, uh, a public lecture or the showing of a film or a series of films, uh, some of the kinds of things that the Sick Lens does. Uh, these things are anthropologically Rituals. I mean, <laughs> what anthropologists call rituals that are things that are done again and again. And at every occasion, it brings people together in a way that reinforces for all of them the value of their shared community or their shared uh, goals and aspirations and so on. Opening an exhibition about six at the National Museum of the United States, uh, which when it opened, by the way, just happened to be right next to an exhibition about baseball. <laughs> I mean, how American can you get? Uh, that was a very, very significant occasion for many people. And the exhibition that we did in Washington was at the Natural, Natural History Museum. Uh, as I mentioned, it was going to be part of a Hall of Asian Peoples, which never materialized. 
but this had already started. So it kind of got grandfathered in. It's, it was very difficult really to get exhibition space there. It's, you know, and you have between eight and 10 million people a year visiting this exhibition. So millions of people had the opportunity to view this. And the vast majority of people who come to see the exhibition were not coming to the museum to see this exhibition. They were going to see other things and they found this very attractive uh, visually and because there was also some music that you could hear from the entrances. And uh, so a lot of people came in. That was one of the purposes, one of the purposes to make this not an obscure subject, but a very uh, uh, in, uh, central, uh, interesting subject for many people who had not thought about it before, or maybe had seen six, maybe seen somebody wearing a turban, never really understood what it was about, and they actually took the opportunity to learn more. That was one of the purposes. Another goal, though, was actually for the Sikh community to make sure that they also uh, had every, every reason to understand that they are an important, important uh, part of our, our wider American uh, history and community, and um, that their uh, cultural, the, the importance of their cultural history is, is, is a great one. So when you have something like an exhibition that takes place in a national museum, that's also a kind of um, ritual, the opening events and so on, uh, in, in, in the anthropological sense. It's an opportunity for people to come together and recognize uh, that, yes, uh, what we're doing or what we are uh, is really very important. The original plan for which we began planning this exhibition, that is to fit within a hall of identities and how identity formation takes place with various peoples, ethnic groups, and religions throughout Asia, never happened. But this one component of it, about the six, was sort of grandfathered in and continued to be produced as an exhibition. And we had, therefore, the six legacy of the Punjab as a wonderful exhibition, which kind of stood out on its own. Now, uh, uh, Sandeep Singh Brar kindly put together this uh, Sikh Heritage Gallery online, which is actually still up online, showing what the exhibition was like in 2004. You never see the same Sikh exhibition twice <laughs> because we're constantly changing it uh, for the protection of the artifacts, but also because that's the nature of the exhibition. You, you can see in his online uh, show, some members of the Sikh Heritage Foundation, they were the major initial funders of the exhibition. The other, and in addition, Dr. Narendra Singh Kapani was the major lender for the exhibition. Without uh, these people and, and many others uh, who uh, came afterwards to help, uh, this would not have been possible. So I mentioned earlier, this was not done by me, it was done by lots and lots of people. And it was done partly with a lot of uh, community uh, support for its funding, but also in other ways. So you have to make always an exhibition that looks good no matter which direction you go and how you get there. Um, I have an image of the other entrance, and I wanted to use that to illustrate a couple of things. One is um, you'll see a lot of sort of like the equivalent of a cardboard cutout. It's not cardboard, but anyway, it's a cutout images of a photograph of people. And there, the Silver Spring Gurdwara, it's not far from here. Um, these are just uh, people, of, uh, our neighbors, people of all kinds, ages, that are, who are six. And that's basically a message that each of these venues has informed people about. They said, look, we are your friends, we're your neighbors, we are six, and they're Americans, they're in you know, tennis shoes, whatever. <laughs> so people walk in, the first, one of the things they see is just everyday people, before they get to this ancient, you know, artifacts and wonderful old armor from India and so on, because we're establishing the fact that this is, these are this is, this is communities all around us who are actively participating in these traditions. It also emphasized that there was community involvement throughout the construction of this exhibition. One of the things I want to emphasize is that in some of the later venues, people used duplicates or photographic 
images of some of the original artworks. And we actually had to do that right from the beginning. This initial age of the Sikh gurus, for example, has a blown up graphic image of the 10 gurus uh, gouache on paper artwork, which was also present and separately framed at the opening. But the uh, framed uh, image in the vitrine, the rather the graphic panel that you're seeing here in the vitrine was there permanently. It's designed to be used permanently and the original uh, watercolor on paper simply does not withstand long periods in the light. So for the protection of uh, really authentic artworks, you cannot leave them out very long. Uh, and so you see here a combination of the original artworks, like this Tanjore painting uh, in a gold frame, and actually that the Janam Saki that's open in the middle is an original. But on the lower right, you see the photographic image of another Janam Saki, and that's because it's so fragile. Although there is a real wonderful potential for exhibiting it sometime in the future, you'd have to design an exhibit that's a very different kind to do that. Here's some close-ups of some of the material in there. Here's the Tanjore uh, painting. Um, and this is the original Janam Saki that we used. Now, what I want to mention about the exhibition also as a general observation, which is why I'm kind of going slowly at the beginning, bringing up all these other topics, is that we tried to combine conservation work um, with the exhibition, but this was just too much conservation work. Let's take a look at this Janam Saki. We used, as I said, the photograph of it in the lower right corner of that cabinet rather than the original. It would have been nice to use the original. Someday we should use the original for an exhibition, but, but it, it's gonna have to have a very special exhibition designed for itself. And this is a wonderful project, one of many that we find in the course of doing an exhibit. It would, would be great to, to publish this entire book. But you see the illustration is quite fragile. That kind of painting is very common in Sikh uh, paintings. Uh, it's called, it's the, the color is called verdigris. And verdigris has a chemical composition which inherently is causing the paper substrate to deteriorate. It can be neutralized, but it's a very kind of complex and expensive process to do. So you see a piece of the original paper has fallen out in the middle uh, from this uh, Janam Saki tale of the life of the guru. Of, of Guru Nanak Dev Ji. And that's because the substrate has become so weak there. So you'd have to really stabilize this entire book before you could put it on exhibition. This is the kind of thing we love to do as a special project, maybe some special exhibition in the future, to do a real conservation project and then put this, and then be able to include this. Now we did some, this was not one that we were able to undertake. Now, here we have the, a very interesting issue. <laughs> the Sikhs are very familiar with this. American non-Sikhs usually are not. We, in a museum environment, how do we talk about and put on display a Guru Granth Sahib Ji? When we have a situation in which people would be normally expected to cover their heads, take off their shoes, and other forms of respect in the presence of the Guru Granth Sahib. So a label has to explain there that what you're seeing is just a prop used in place of the Guru Granth Sahib, but everything else is original material. And actually, statistically, this is one of the things people remembered most, which is kind of unusual because in exhibitions, when you go through and survey people afterwards, what they remember is usually some spectacular artwork. Whereas in this exhibition, one of the things people remembered most was the complete absence of it. <laughs> of an artwork or, or an object on display. Uh, well, I'm, I'm sort of rushing through this, but the founding of the Khalsa and other things I depicted here, and the five Ks at this point are also described very briefly. And then we move to, uh, on to the history of the six in the Punjab uh, after the period of the early gurus. Um, we uh, include this section talking about, for example, 
Maharaja Ranjit Singh. And we have some wonderful old weapons and we have also a set of ivory images. Uh, here's the ivory image that were like little portraits of, the, of uh, Maharaja Ranjit Singh with his entire court. Um, among the things to note were the presence of many non-Sikhs in prominent positions within the court of advisors and uh, the openness to uh, and tolerance of a wide variety of religious traditions. This interesting uh, vitrine is actually what ended up happening within our exhibition from an early plan to have just one little vitrine about the six, which we were thinking of using in back in 2000, the Sikh martial tradition as, a, as an image of Sikhism and even did a very early design for that, which I published in a paper on the history of this project. And I will also mention that from the beginning, we were involved in a lot of community discussions long before the exhibition took shape about how Sikhs wanted to be represented and what kinds of things should be there. And uh, everybody felt that the uh, Darbar Sahib in Amritsar was a very important topic, the so-called Golden Temple, it's a central image of Sikhism. So we ended up, man, thanks to uh, uh, the, the, the Malik family, the family of Mr. Gurdip Singh Malik in, in Los Angeles. So we ended up being able to commission through the family of Mr. Gurdip Singh Malik in Los Angeles as their donation, they, they commissioned the creation of a model of the Golden Temple, which was a really very popular part of this exhibition and has continued to be so. Um, it got a lot of publicity in India, <laughs> as you can see, uh, when it was when it was first uh, being put together and about to be shipped to the United States. Um, but it has ended up always a very, in a very central location and everybody has always wanted it. It's actually been used at several places while the exhibition itself is awaiting its transport to the next venue. The Golden Temple is often put up in Gurdwaras or other locations. One thing people are always asking about they've never really understood is the turbans. <laughs> so we put this section, a whole section about the Sikh turban in this part of the exhibition. And as, tra as it traveled, you know, uh, this got a lot of attention and got some variation with local variations. And in fact, I'm not that familiar with a lot of sports. And there was one that was in Texas that I thought had a very unusual uh, symbol on it, and I asked some of the Sikh uh, elders there if they could explain that symbol to me. And it turns out that was the that was a turban with the symbol of the San Antonio Spurs basketball team. So uh, there's a lot of variation, <laughs> but um, uh, the fact is that that that's one of the questions that non-Sikhs really have about Sikhism. You know, what's with the turban? So. I would say that as a general rule for people putting exhibitions together, whenever you do an exhibition, you have to do a lot of sort of testing because an audience testing, because if people walk through an exhibition, on, you know, a lot of people will come out and they'll have one question and somebody else will have a different question. But if a lot of people go through an exhibition and they all have the same question, then in my opinion, that means this is an unsuccessful exhibition because if everybody goes to the exhibition, they come out with the same question that they want, want to ask, then that means you should have answered that question in the exhibition. And one of the big questions people have is why do six wear a turban? So this was the place to cover that topic, right? In the section on um, how do six practice their faith. Um, here's the Singh twins uh, paintings that we had included, for example, that, that wonderful painting uh, that, that, that very memorable painting, uh, 1984, um, and uh, others that uh, are really central to everybody's memory of seeing this exhibition, I think, if you did see these uh, paintings. I have some close-ups of all of these paintings. Some of the Lahore schools are not Sikh, Hindu or Islamic as well, but they all have this same problem, if you want to call it a problem, of their preservation. In the painting itself, you can see that there is some uh, flaking taking place 
And that's because the nature of the painting on, and, and the nature of the paints used on this material over time will flake. So you, you'd need a very careful conservation and yet that's not really taking place. And why is that not taking place? Because I think this school of painting was kind of undervalued in, in some ways. Um, it was too uh, Indian, I suppose, uh, for really acceptance by British and European artists and art historians. At the same time, at the time of independence of uh, India and Pakistan, it was also too Western. Uh, and uh, so it kind of fell between the cracks. And here you have this, in my opinion, really world-class tradition of painting that fell between the cracks and is not really being recognized for the importance and the quality of the art. And uh, that's changing now. But what we know is that meanwhile, an entire school of art is falling apart wherever it happens to be. <laughs> and it's the kind of challenge where you'd like to say, can we do an exhibition in a really serious catalog, which would build into it the funding needed to do a careful restoration of the paintings, study of their history and, and, the, and the artists and so on, travel the exhibition around and so on. Because we've seen again and again that um, exhibitions can be good for collections, but it would take something like that. And there's only so many of those any person can do in a career and any institution can undertake. Uh, but hopefully somebody will take that on and, and, and that would be a great thing. I would love to help in any way I could. I mentioned the Janam Saki also another preservation issue. Um, the, I, I mentioned the uh, verdigris as a chemical composition, which looked great. It looked magnificent, bright green, but it causes the substrate of the paper itself uh, to deteriorate. And that's a big issue. So um, I would love to see entire books like this, illustrated books, really published and in translation, understood, but including within that, hopefully, the preservation of the originals, which definitely needs to be done, and that's something for the future. Well, we hope that uh, people will be watching you saying this and get inspired to invest. Yeah, no, that's what I hope very much uh, will happen, and that's why I keep talking about it. And I have to say, we've been very grateful to the people who have contributed to the Sikh Heritage Project. We've done a lot about this already, but there's much, much more to be done. Research on art is continuing also on applications of new technology. This isn't really a new technology used, but for the Tanjore painting that I mentioned, central to our section on the history of the Sikh gurus, you know, uh, the tradition within the family that had it was it was an older painting than it looked to be. So I naturally thought, well, probably this must be then something that was painted over a uh, painting underneath it, uh, because otherwise, why would it be tradition of being an older painting? So when I did the the x-ray, though, um, you know, I, it doesn't, you can see for yourself, if you look at this x-ray, that there's no older painting underneath it. At the same time, you see a very interesting phenomenon here that this is made of multiple planks underneath that single layer. And the planks are held together with these double pointed nails, nails pointed on both sides that are holding the two planks together. Uh, I believe that's a technique that comes from shipbuilding. I'm not sure about that. But uh, anyway, uh, lots to discover that we didn't know before. This is the book by by, by C.C. Anderson with Rupinder Singh. So this is, this, are his, this is his book. This was published in India, but we try to get involved and help where we can. So now you know of the Court of Lahore that August Schuft did, that huge painting that mm -hmm. uh, I believe may be in jeopardy. Uh, is that something that the Smithsonian could get involved in, in terms of restoration or even moving it to a better? Uh, location in Pakistan or elsewhere? Well, like many other artifacts and objects that are in danger or magnificent, it's not our property. And so it's not for us to say. 
our, in mm -hmm. principle, it would be part of our mission to try to help its preservation. You mentioned that people almost stumbled upon this exhibition rather than coming to it from uh, a deliberate perspective. Can you generalize about the, the viewers, Sikhs, non-Sikhs, if there was a consensus about the exhibition and how you would, uh, f how you feel about the success of what you've done? First, I would say I feel very happy about the success, but not because I did it. I would feel the success of a huge community of people working together. And that's the success that I feel. Um, Six were very, very enthusiastic about this exhibition. And it's, I think many six who would not have come to our museum came to see the exhibition. That's, there's no question about that. A lot of people who were six or friends, families, other people who knew about Sikhism and who had heard about this exhibition came to the museum specifically to see this exhibition. That's true. However, let's face it. This is a museum that in those days, you know, we were having uh, uh, between seven and 10 million visitors a year the vast majority of those visitors were not coming to see this exhibition. They were coming to see all the dinosaurs and all the Hope Diamond and all the things that the Smithsonian is famous for. And while there, uh, came across this exhibition and really learned a lot about this subject. And so in that sense, I think all the people who, who helped put this exhibition together felt it was great that this happened here. Uh, at a place like our museum where uh, a lot of people would see this who might not have seen it otherwise. If the exhibition had been, had taken place in a, in a Gurdwara as a visitor sent it to a Gurdwara or something, that would have made it maybe effective for the people who saw it, but the audience would have been quite different. Out of curiosity, is there a encapsulation of the tenets of Sikhism anywhere in the exhibition so that when people leave, they'll know well, what do they believe in, or is that not part of your mission? I think people get a sense of uh, values of Sikhism. Um, and uh, we decided not to try to list dogmas, um, but we listed the, the teachings of the gurus uh, the, and the messages of the gurus and the messages at many points uh, citing the Guru Granth Sahib Ji. But no, we did not try to have a special case on dogma. We were talking about uh, cultural tradition. It's a museum uh, of the Smithsonian and a cultural history program of research on cultural history. Um, I think if this were maybe at a theological institute, it would have been a different kind of exhibition. The Sikh community or the Sikh diaspora is a very, very successful one and there are gurdwaras everywhere. And if you want to build a gurdwara anecdotally, I can tell you that the money will come. Because the Sikh diaspora has been so blessed, do you foresee this kind of an exhibition um, helping to add to their investment in Sikhi through uh, means other than uh, building gurdwaras and um, educating the youth about Sikh culture and Sikh history. What can be done uh, with an exhibition like this and future ways to inspire an investment in Sikh culture and identity? Yes, thanks for that, uh, that question. I, I think the help that people did to put this exhibition together, to have these initiatives like conferences, like uh, the creation of books, the conservation work, all these things are really forms of sewa for the Sikh community of service to others, you know? And I do hope that as the Sikh community uh, becomes more successful and, and, and can see how valuable things like our uh, outreach efforts through exhibit, through books, through conferences, through film series, and this sort of thing 
how effective those things can be, that they will step forward and really participate even more in, in this area. I know that, uh, you know, we've never, in, within our Sikh Heritage Project anyway at the Smithsonian, we've never been trying to kind of build an empire of any kind. We see the valuable need for some specific thing that should be done. And then we sometimes call on people and say, can you help us find the funding or help give up some of your time and make this happen? And with something as big as the Sikh, Sikh Legacy of the Punjab exhibition, that took a lot of people and a lot of time and, and a lot of people had to you know, make some wonderful contributions. Um, but there's a lot more to be done. But even if it's on a small scale in a little place, you know, people all over the country should recognize that their heritage is something that they could do a lot more with in terms of just uh, helping everybody understand uh, the traditions and, and cultural heritage of Sikhism through local exhibitions and through sharing um, music and literature and other activities, conferences, we'll be happy to help. And in fact, that's one of the purposes of the Sikh Heritage Project. If you have an idea and you're not sure how to do it, feel free to contact me and we'll be happy to help. Well, you can't ask for more than that, people. I hope you've really enjoyed your adventure uh, with Dr. Taylor. And uh, I'll now pass the baton on to Vicky for a sign off. Thank you, Paul, for your uh, wonderful uh, uh, wisdom and insights into the working of uh, putting up these uh, exhibitions and uh, greatly appreciated uh, your time and thank you. So I really thank everybody who's been a big supporter of the Smithsonian Sikh Heritage Project. And we're happy that we've been able to do several just wonderful, wonderful projects. I personally am grateful for the opportunity to have read quite a bit and still have a lot more to do in reading uh, about the subject of Sikh heritage. And uh, I look forward to continuing strong Sikh heritage project, hopefully long into the future. So thanks very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much.